get irritated when tools are out of the reach of the average home game woodworker. Like, for the last decade or so, everybody has been telling you that you must have a low angle bevel up jack plane. These things are game changers and you've got to have one in your shop. Except they're pretty pricey. On the low end, they're over $100, and on the high end, you could spend three or four hundred. That's a lot of money for a plane. But look, I make planes all the time, so why don't we just make one of these right here in the home shop with regular tools that lots of people own? I mean, what's the worst that could happen? We could waste three or four days of shop time and destroy a bunch of useful materials? Would that really be so- Oh. Actually, that would be kind of bad. I really hope that doesn't happen. So it's not like I'm the first person to ever try this. For instance, this dude, whose name I cannot pronounce, did a beautiful low angle jack plane, but his is sort of a complex, fancy build with a Veritas adjuster. I'm thinking of something a little bit more low to the ground, using common off-the-shelf parts, no adjuster. But I think there's gotta be a reason why people don't usually make these planes in the home shop. In fact, there's two reasons. Hold on, I did a sketch. Problem number one, you can see that low angle 12 degree bed there. Down by the mouth, the material of the bed gets so thin that if we made it out of wood, like most homemade planes, it would just shatter under the force of planing. No wood is gonna stand up to that. So we're gonna have to make it out of something else. Problem number two, we typically adjust homemade wooden planes with a hammer. And tapping the blade to advance it works just fine. But if you look at our sketch, what's that thing right behind the blade? It's the handle. That's really gonna get in the way of hitting the iron with a hammer. But I've been thinking about that, and it's occurred to me. If we can strike the rear of a plane to retract a hammer, doesn't it make sense that we could flip the plane around and hit it on the toe to advance the hammer? Well, I tried it on a few of my planes, and we totally can. It works. There's that problem solved. And as for that low bed angle and that thin mouth, well, it seems like we should just replace that part of the plane with something different. Maybe a metal. Maybe aluminum. I think that would work really well. In fact, I know it would work well because, well, I already did it. Here's my prototype, and it's a good proof of concept. Right down here at the mouth, I just put in a thick piece of aluminum and then filed that down to the 12 degree bed angle, and it doesn't distort or flex or do anything. It works fine. This plane cuts. The only problem is it doesn't cut that great. It's a little bit too light, a bit flexible, and even though this part is strong enough to withstand planing, every time I tighten down the lever cap, this whole block of aluminum wants to shift outward a little bit. It's just not attached to the sides of the plane well enough, and it's so thin, I don't see a lot of ways to attach it to wood effectively. What we need to do instead is make the entire sides and bottom of the plane out of a single piece of material. To build the real plane, I'm going to start with this piece of aluminum channel. Aluminum is strong, but it's easy to work with standard woodworking tools. I got this piece off of eBay, and it cost 20 bucks. It's the biggest expense for the entire build. I'll start by marking out the mouth location, because that determines pretty much everything else. I've got a full set of plans, and you can use those if you decide to tackle this build. When you design your body, you have a lot of freedom in the way that it's shaped. You need access to the blade, and you need a spot for the handle. But other than that, you can just kind of try to make it look cool. In my design, I just went for a lot of flowing curves. Aluminum is very easy to cut, but I filled my channel with wood to cut down on vibration and grabbing from the bandsaw blade. It's mostly a safety thing, but it's also gonna give me a cleaner finish on my cuts. The great thing about aluminum is that it works with standard woodworking tools. It cuts like butter, but the finished product is still gonna be durable, much more durable than a wooden plane. I'm using power tools for speed in this build, but you can do everything that I'm doing with hand tools. You can do all the cutting with a hacksaw, files, and sandpaper. It'll come out just as good. Once the bandsaw work is done, I'll knock out the support block and the body is totally roughed out. Then I'll take it to the belt sander and quickly fare in the curves. A lot of the curves in this plane are too tight for the belt sander, so I'll use round rasps to get into those tight spots. This work goes quickly and everything looks smooth and nice. I also finish up with a cheap sanding drum mounted in the drill press, and that gives me a beautiful final finish on all the interior curves. For the flat spots, plain old metal files will give you a finer finish than most abrasives. I'm gonna make the rear infill by hand, just to show that doing this with hand tools isn't a big deal. Anybody with basic hand skills can make this plane. I'll start with a piece of walnut, cut it to rough size, and then lay out all the final dimensions and slowly work it down to my lines. 
For stuff like this, using hand tools is a real advantage. You can slowly creep up on your final dimensions and get a very tight fit. In my case, the piece of aluminum channel that I bought is a tiny bit too short. So I'm going to want the infills to stick out about an inch on the front and the rear. So for this rear infill, I need to cut away a step so that the channel can sit in the infill and the wood will come down and extend the sole out the bottom. I'll start by making a series of cross cuts to define the area that I'm going to remove. I'll knock out the waste with a chisel, but I'll leave a couple of steps in the wood. That's going to give my router plane something to register against while I level out the bottom of my step. Once everything is smooth and even, I'll knock out the last pieces. The rear infill is done, and it slots right into my aluminum channel. None of this woodwork is particularly difficult, but you can avoid all of it if you're smarter than me and just buy a longer piece of aluminum. Next, I'm going to mark out my 12 degree bed angle. Rough cut it on the bandsaw, and then start hand lapping it with coarse sandpaper on my table saw. Glass would work really well here too. This is another place where slow is good. The bed of the plane is the one area that needs to be absolutely perfect. Everything else can be fixed or adjusted later on, but if you've got a bad bed, the plane just won't cut. It's got to be flat and exactly square to the sides. So I take my time, slowly lapping it down and checking it frequently with a machinist square. Once I'm happy with the bed, I'll clamp the rear infill into the plane and drill out the mouth. After I've removed most of the material with the drill, I'll connect a few of the holes using a small file. Then I can thread a hacksaw blade into the mouth and finish cutting in both directions. Then I'll have enough room to get in there with larger files and square up the mouth opening. Now at first, I thought I was going to be able to file that 12 degree angle into the mouth with the whole thing in one piece. I was just going to like take files and just sort of ride down the infill and gently file away that material so that the bed would be at that 12 degree angle. And I wasn't sure that that was going to work. And it totally didn't work. At all. Plan B. I just quickly cut out the toe of the plane and I'll be able to reattach that later when I do the front infill. To file in the mouth, I clamped in the off cut from making the bed. That's got the correct angle and it's going to allow me to guide my files. You can see in this side shot why filing out that narrow mouth never would have worked with the plane in one piece. It's a very shallow bed and there's actually a lot of material that needs to be removed. I need plenty of room for tool access. But now that I have the toe cut away, I can get in there with any size file I want and remove the material quickly and efficiently. As I progress, I use a square to see if the bed and the mouth are coplanar. Right now they're not, so I have to keep working. I got everything really close with files. Then I jointed the edge of a board, glued on some sandpaper, and used that as a custom lapping plate to smooth everything out. Then I glued the rear infill into place and finished lapping that so that everything was even. For the front infill, I just used this big hunk of walnut, but you can laminate up smaller stock if that's what you've got on hand. You'll want a tight fit between the infill and the body. But then, as far as the design goes, it's mostly how it looks and feels. So get the infill in place, look at it, shape it, look at it again, shape it some more, grab it and see how it feels, repeat, and when you like how it looks, you're done. Now, I also need to replace the aluminum toe piece that I cut out before, and this infill needs to extend one inch out the toe of the plane. It's got to overhang just like the rear one does. But after just a couple minutes of saw and chisel work, the aluminum plate fits and it's ready to glue in. Now the plane needs a handle, and obviously I could just cut that out of a hardwood board and be done with it. But I'm really enjoying the blend of wood and metal in this plane, and I want to keep that going in the handle. So I laminated together several sheets of aluminum with small slices of hardwood into one solid blank. Once the epoxy dried, I traced on a shape that I really like from a rare old plane that I have. This handle is durable and it also looks nice. I'll include this design in the plans so that you'll have it. With the shape laid out, it's just bandsaw, sander, more sander, and then a lot of hand shaping. Lots of people do the roundovers for a plane handle on a router table, but I'm just not getting my fingers that close to a spinning router bit. Doing it by hand gives you a nice result and a custom fit. Now, since I promised that this was going to be a low to the ground basic build, you might wonder why I'm putting all of this time into the handle. Well, I'm showing off, obviously. Once the handle's done, I just need to chop a mortise into the body and then glue the handle in. A 
tight fit between the body and the handle means the glue hardly needs to dry, and I can get right on with the build. Now, after a lot of painstaking work, I'm finally in the home stretch, and what I mostly need is hardware for the plane. I'm going to make the lever cap out of this piece of aluminum plate that I just got out of a dumpster. I'll rough out the basic profile on the saw, and then do most of the shaping on the belt sander. The big radius on top of the sander lets me do nice curves and smooth transitions. You can do all of this with rasps and files, but even a cheap sander makes aluminum work very fast. I'm also going to need a thumb screw, and I've got a quick formula for how you can make one. You'll need one brass pipe cap and one quarter twenty brass screw. That screw has to be brass, otherwise when you tighten it down it's going to mess up your plane iron. Just put the screw into the pipe cap, rotate it a couple times to make sure that the screw is totally plumb, and then fill the cap with five minute epoxy. Let it dry overnight and it'll be perfectly solid. The flat sides on the cap are going to give you plenty of grip for tightening it down, and the epoxy holds up just fine. I did one of these a year ago, and it's still rock solid. I've got links to all the parts, materials, and tools for this build down in the description. Now I'll drill and tap the top of my lever cap, run in the screw to test it, and then drill and tap the sides for quarter twenty machine screws. Now it's time to test assemble the plane. You might notice this iron here, and I also made this 100% at home. I've got an entire video on how to do it. You can check that out to learn my easy home recipe for heat treating. Once the whole thing is together, then it's on to the long process of lapping it. So I'm back to the sandpaper, on the table saw, and even with aluminum, this takes a while. You can't skimp here. Once I've got the sole trued up, I'm going to take a little bit of time to just pretty the plane up. I've gone this far, and I want it to look nice. So I'm going to sand, shape, deburr, fill in, cut, and apply a nice coat of linseed oil to the whole thing to bring out the look of the wood. And I've got to be honest, the finished product does look really good. I mean, just because this is a workhorse tool doesn't mean it needs to look like one. It can still be pretty, but the looks don't really matter. What it's time to do now is test it. And as soon as I went to test it out, I couldn't because this glue joint right here had just popped right open. Which makes sense. If you're counting on epoxy to hold together a tool like this, you're going to be disappointed. It needs some sort of mechanical interlock to hold together. So I went to Home Depot and grabbed some brass screws. I drilled through the sides into the body and then added a light countersink to each hole. Then I ran the screws in until they filled up the countersink, sawed off the heads, filed everything flush, and then relapped and polished the sides of the plane. When you do it this way, you still end up with a little bit of the screw head in that countersink, and that's enough to hold everything together really well. But by cutting off the screw heads and lapping everything flat, you end up with a sleek look, and it doesn't mess up the aesthetics of the plane. Now I'm finally ready to test it. Right off the jump, I can see why people like to use these planes as short jointers. This plane is absolutely surgical on the edge of a board. It does a quicker and cleaner job than almost anything I've ever used. And since I was doing my first test, I decided to play around with the adjustment. I pulled the iron back further and further, taking progressively finer shavings until I was taking pretty much dust off the wood. The surface I was leaving was excellent, and the plane is very adjustable. You can get any amount of iron you want. And then, of course, it was time to try on some board faces. And here the plane did, I don't know, okay? The long length of the sole keeps it from getting into the hollows of the boards, the way a shorter smoothing plane would. And overall, you've got to work a lot harder to get a good surface. Also, when I was doing coarse grained boards like this oak here, the plane did have a tendency to leave some light aluminum streaks on the wood. This is the reason that Stanley stopped producing aluminum planes decades ago. I kind of thought that modern alloys like the one I used would be strong enough not to stain the wood, but it turns out I was wrong about that. If you just kiss the plane with a tiny bit of furniture wax, that issue goes away and the wax lasts for a really long time, but it is still definitely annoying. Just like every other plane I own, this one was really great on some woods, not quite as great on some other woods, kind of a mixed bag, sort of like every tool. On woods like cherry, it took some incredible shavings and left a really nice surface. Some other boards like oak were eh, kind of meh. Of course, one of the big things you hear about low angle planes is that they are perfect for end grain. And here, I have to agree. You can just put a board in your vise, 
hack away at the end grain, and this plane leaves a surprisingly nice surface with very little work on the user end. And then I took it over to the shooting board, and here I was really impressed. This thing glided through the end grain of this oak board, and it was just as good on walnut, cherry, all the other species that I tried. It's easy to see why people are so attached to these planes for shooters. This one probably works better than any other plane I own. Of course, this is the part of the video where I want to say, you can build your own low angle smoothing plane for like 40 bucks. Buy the plans, build the plane. Don't buy those factory made tools from those corporations. Crush the man! But I really can't say that. The truth is, this tool's performance is uh, very mixed. It does some things well, some things not very well. I definitely wouldn't call it an essential tool. If you gave me a choice between this and one of my regular Stanley number no. 5 jack planes, I would probably take the number no. 5. It's more versatile and dependable. But the thing I don't know is, is this plane only sort of mediocre because I didn't do a super job of building it, or because it's just not that great of a tool? Problem is, I don't have anything to compare it to. I don't own a commercially made low angle jack plane. So here's what I've been thinking. Maybe I should grab the Stanley, that's the lowest price one out there, and see how it compares. I'll put the Stanley low angle jack up against mine and see if theirs performs any better. I've always been kind of skeptical about low angle planes to begin with, so that should be sort of fun. Now, I don't take free stuff on this channel, so if I'm gonna buy this plane, I have to do it out of my own pocket. So please let me know down in the comments if you actually want to watch a video like that so I have some idea whether or not that's gonna be money well spent. And since we're talking about money, projects like this would be impossible without my patrons on Patreon. They always encourage me to experiment and try new things. They had a great reaction to this plane when I showed them some of the initial prototypes, and they urged me to keep going and get it as perfect as I could. Not only did my patrons give me the financial support that makes stuff like this possible, they also provide me with a community of peers that gives me the enthusiasm to keep going when stuff like this gets tough. If you'd like to be part of that community, go on over to patreon.com slash Rex Kruger and take a look at the early access, rewards, and exclusive content that I have only for my patrons. And for everybody who's watching, thank you so much for coming along on this whole journey with me. It's been really exciting, and I hope it's not over. Let me know down in the comments what direction you think it should take from here on out. And thanks for watching.